So, uh, welcome everyone to the session five trades that all top performing automation engineers have, um, scheduled by Marco Cruz. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you, Marco, here. Uh, thanks for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invite to this conference. I'm really excited about uh, being here and also hearing uh, what the other speakers have to say. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, who may be listening, listening in. Um, so a uh, little bit of background on me. I am the founder of Automate Now, which is a company that focuses on helping people succeed in software automation. Um, I have uh, eight years, uh, more than eight years in software testing, and um, I'm just passionate about this industry, just testing in general. It's something that um, really uh, motivates me to just keep sharing knowledge and everything that um, anyone who, who will listen. Uh, so today um, we're talking about the five traits uh, that uh, all top performing automation engineers um, have, right? And that is a pretty bold, bold statement. And um, my promise to you is uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you will uh, come away with, uh, you know, some concrete uh, information that you can take into action to take your career to the next level. Uh, there is a caveat to this, you know, some of the stuff that you're going to see here is not for everyone. Uh, some of you may not be willing uh, uh, to try some of this stuff. And, and th there's a reason for it. And that, that's why I'm, I've titled this uh, for top performing people. You know, it's, this is something that's going to help you get to the next level in your career. Um, and also some of the stuff that you're going to see here, uh, it's applicable not only to the testing industry, but other, um, you know, like uh, other industries in just about everyday life. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, dive in. So I'll start with a question, you know, why do you think that some people get lucky? You know, sometimes we see uh, people achieve success, uh, they get paid raises, they get promotions. Uh, it appears that they're always in the right place at the right time uh, and it, everything seems to be going their way. And, and on the surface, uh, it may seem like uh, they just have good luck on their side. That, that's how we summarize it. We, when we don't understand something, we, we, you cannot um, logically uh, explain something. We just say, oh, that's, that's good luck. They're just lucky, you know? Um, but what I would like to propose to you and, and just make you think about what if it's more than just luck, you know, and that's what we're going to explore in this talk. So here's Seneca's definition of luck. And um, I, I would like to say that, you know, a, a lottery winner, uh, they still need to buy a lottery ticket in order to win. So essentially, they're not lucky, you know, even even person who wins the lottery, they had to take uh, a certain action, they had to make a small investment. Um, you know, they had to go to the store, uh, buy a, a ticket, uh, pick the numbers, you know, so they, they took some type of action in order to put themselves in line to be able to have a chance of winning the lottery, right? So there was some action in their part. Um, and, and this leads me to my next uh, statement, you know, which is a person who is not willing, for example, uh, who's not planning to learn how to play chess, they're not going to look up the instructions to learn how to play chess. So it's a, it starts with a decision, you know, it starts with something that, okay, I want to achieve this goal by a certain time, or I want to get this pay raise, um, you know, and, and this is, it starts with a concrete um, definition of what your target is, you know, and that, that's, that's what I'm trying to um, drive home here is that at some point in your life, you're going to have to make a decision, okay, what it is that you want to do, uh, how you want to take your career to the next level, and hopefully um, you, you're going to see some good examples here. So let's keep moving here. So how can you prepare for, for the opportunity that, that Seneca is, is describing here, right? Let's take a look at some uh, preparedness actions. And you know, as, as, uh, this, this takes me to item number one in the list, which is communication. You know? And as testers, we focus a lot on, on the quality of the software, you know? but we pay very little attention to the quality of our communication. And on the screen, you're seeing a picture of, um, of, of two silhouettes, right? The person on the left, uh, they're able to get from point A to point B, but you'll notice that they're, uh, they don't do it very effectively. They're, they're kind of erratic, you know, they're kind of all over the place. Eventually they get to the point where they want to be, but it takes them a little while. While the person on the right, they're able to get from point A to point B with uh, very minor issues, you know, that they're pretty much in a straight line. You know, they're, they're more effective communicators. And um, that is the distinction that we're trying to drive here. You know, that's that's the difference that having good communication is going to uh, is, is going to do in your career. And um, who benefits from good communication? You know, it's, it firstly uh, it starts with you. You know, you you benefit because um, you become a more effective communicator, and and also your team will benefit. You know, your your team will become more effective, more efficient. You know, and, and more robust overall. 
and, and thirdly, the company, the, the organization that you're working for, they're going to benefit um, from this com good communication. And you may be wondering, like, how does the company benefit? You know, um, if you, you know, I'm sure most of you or all, all of us, you know, at some point have been in search for a job and we'll go on, uh, on some uh, search platform, you know, Indeed or LinkedIn or what, what have you, you know, and you will see the job description and pretty much 99% of them will have uh, somewhere in there that's going to save um, a good communication skills as one of the requirements for applying for that job, you know, for getting that job. And it, what do you think that is? You know, what do you think employers value good communication? It's, it's important for them is they're not just trying to fill up empty space in that job description. You know, it's, it, there's a reason why they put that bullet point in there. And um, there was a study that was conducted in 2011. It was done by um, David Grossman, his group, um, conducted a, a study on 400 companies, which uh, had each had 100,000 employees. And what they discovered is that on average, you know, the companies, each company had a, a loss of $62.4 million, that's US dollars, uh, per company because of inadequate communication to and between employees. You know, I, I want to say that again, and it's $62.4 million per company. That's pretty significant, you know, because there was ineffective communication between and, and to employees. You know? So that's, that's a pretty significant figure. Um, so that's why companies value that, you know, value the, the good communication. So let's have a look at a formula that I, that I discovered on this while I was researching this topic. And this formula comes from the late MIT professor, uh, Patrick Winston. He defines the quality of communication by this formula, which is the function of K times P times T, in which the letter K represents knowledge, P represents practice, and T represents talent. And I would like to draw your attention to the size of the letters. You'll notice that the letter K is much larger than the letter T. And there's, there's a reason for that. And that is because having pure talent is not enough to be good, uh, have good communication. It's the knowledge that you have that's going to have the biggest impact on how you communicate. Um, having a good uh, breadth and wealth of knowledge is, is, is going to profoundly influence your, your, your effectiveness, being an effective communicator. Um, there's a quote that I like. It's by, by Whitney Jr. Uh, Whitney Jr. Uh, he says, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And this is where the, where the P comes into play. You know, we have to be ready for that opportunity. So even if you are not, um, don't have the chance right now or, or, or a, a certain um, a skill, you know, it's, better, it's better for you to be prepared for that. So when Let's say, for example, uh, that you're trying to move into a certain job, right? But you don't have an opportunity to move into that job or that type of job, whatever the job may be. You could start preparing now so that when you do have the chance or you're able to move into that role, you're ready for it. You know, that's that's the preparedness part. And um, that's really going to help you a lot, you know. Um, I, I can speak from experience in the past where I may have been doing a certain skill, and then I wanted to move into a certain another area. And you know, I started learning on my own on my free time. And when the time came, I was I was ready. I was prepared for that. And when um, I got interviewed, I was ready. I had all the answers, and I was able able to move in and perform effectively in that in that new role. Um, so we see that knowledge is very important. Uh, but what type of knowledge uh, should you uh, have? Let's go to the next slide. And here we have point number two, uh, which is product knowledge. You know. Uh, it's important for us to get as testers, you know, to get uh, very familiar with the, the software that we're testing, you know, what, what, what the application you're testing. Uh, in this example, you're seeing a picture of a cockpit, you know, um, and, and what I like to, the analogy that I like to bring is uh, um, a pilot has to be very well acquainted with every instrument within the cockpit. They have to be familiar with everything that's there, you know, at their disposal, and they have to be good at what they do at their job, right? Um, because what happens is that Let's say that there's an emergency and they have to take some uh, emergency action. They have to, they, they don't have time to call somebody at, at that time. You know, they, they, they have to be um, very um, effective, you know, in, in using all those instruments and to be, to be able to execute at a high level. And this, I think the same thing should apply to testers. You should strive to be um, very good at, at knowing um, your product, you know, what you're testing, you know, become very familiar with it. And that is going to help you to become a better tester um, overall. Um, so that's that's what I want to, you know, just leave it with in that, you know, with that regard. Um, you know, not doing this, you know, what could be the, 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 the effects of that, you know? Um, this could lead to catastrophic results in some areas. 
let's say, for example, you're testing some medical, um, you know, software that goes into medical equipment, you know, equipment that is administering medicine to a patient or something like that, you know, that's, um, you know, if you don't do a, a good enough job or a, a very good job, uh, in essence, you know, it could potentially um, be fatal for the patient, you know, you give them uh, too, too high a dose. Uh, and that, you know, that, that means that you have faulty software and um, you didn't go do a good enough job. You know, you, you didn't take your job seriously. Um, you know, that's just one example. Something else that I could think of is, is safety, um, public safety devices, you know, so far, such as uh, traffic lights, you know, there's software that goes into those um, the traffic lights. So you want to be responsible for the software that you're testing. You know, you don't want to crash, you know, cars crashing into one another, you know, um, at traffic points. Um, so that's, you can see how, how everything ties together, you know, just knowing the product, you know, really uh, plays a big role on how good you become, how good a tester you become. Uh, also learning the tech stack, you know, learning uh, how your application is built, you know, what type of frameworks are being used to build the front end, you know, what type of databases, uh, programming languages are being used in the back end. Those things give you a, a better um, knowledge and it prepares you more to be able to test the, the, the application more effectively. Uh, you're able to find those corner cases, uh, those edge cases that are, are sometimes difficult to reproduce. Having that extra bit of knowledge, you know, on how the product is working in the back end gives you um, a better ability to, to, to find those issues. So what other knowledge should you acquire? And here we have uh, item number three on the list, which is domain knowledge. And in, in here, I'm referring to industry domain knowledge. And it has to do with like, for example, medical insurance, financial services. Um, in, my, in the past, I worked in, a, in an insurance company. Uh, prior to going there, I had zero experience in, in insurance. So I took it upon myself to, you know, to level up my skills, to learn that industry, to, to read all the material that was available so that I could become a better tester in that industry. So that's, the, that's what you should strive to do as well. You know, if you're going to a new industry that you have like very little experience in, uh, you should try to get all, you know, become better at familiarizing yourself with the terminology, the jargon that is used in that industry uh, so that it, it makes you a better tester overall. Um, and ex another example that I can give you is, uh, uh, let's say that you're testing software that falls under um, protecting, like here in the United States, we have a law called the HIPAA law and that protects um, medical information, you know, private in, uh, patient information. Let's say that you're testing some application that is dealing with private information um, uh, for medical patients. Um, it, would be, it would benefit you to become familiar with the law. You don't have to be an expert or anything like that, but the more you know about the law, the better you're gonna be able to test that law, you know, um, be able to test the application to make sure that it's, it's following the law. Uh, you don't want the application to be disclosing or, or, or um, you don't want it to get hacked so that information gets, you know, uh, uh, falls into the wrong hands, right? Uh, or in that case, you know, your company may get uh, sued over or those, those issues. You, you don't want that, you know, so just being responsible overall. Now we're moving to item number four, which is continuous improvement. And I'll give you guys uh, a few moments to read this quote from Aaron Nightingale. So uh, I, I think you will agree after reading this that uh, a lot of it, you know, this quote is, is very true. Uh, it could be a harsh reality, but uh, essentially, you know, it's uh, this is this is what uh, really what you're looking at uh, when you're working for any employer, you know, and this is what the employer is looking at from from their end, you know, in, in keeping you, you know, how good of an employee are you? How valuable are you to them? Um, and um I would like to talk about, you know, like the spin cycles, you know, most uh, software is uh, nowadays is being released in spin cycles. Every time we release an application to, to the public, we try to make it better, you know, to provide a better experience, to provide a better product. And I think in the same sense, we should strive to become better, uh, even at least 1% better each day, you know, whatever it is, whether you're reading a book, where you're trying to better your skills, improve, you know, working on a course, uh, something that's going to better you in some way that 1% is gonna help you long, uh, big time in, in the long run. And um, examples that I can give about this, you know, and uh, could be like learning some HTML, learning CSS, uh, learning how to build a, a website. You know, you don't have to be a professional website, but just learning how it works, how it, is, how it is constructed. And I'm aware that some of you may already know this stuff, but there are people out there who think that this is not something that is, is necessary for them to perform their job. Um, but this stuff is really going to benefit you in the long run. 
learning how to query a database or even building a small database, you know, how, how to create tables and rows, uh, input data in there, API testing, load and performance, security testing, or, or even just how the internet works. You know, when you type a URL into the, into the browser, uh, how, does the, how does the information come to you? you know, how, how does that get resolved? You know, um, just things like that is gonna help you. Um, so as a result, you're going to become a, a greater asset to any, any company, any organization they work for. They're going to value you because um, you, you provide a, you know, a, a lot of um, um, good quality for them. You, know, it, it, you become a great asset for that, for that company. And lastly, we have item number five, which is give more than is expected of you. And this is a big one. I think this is the most important one. Um, in, in every field, you're going to have three groups of people. And the group one is uh, those who wait for things to happen. Uh, the group two is those who make things happen. And group three is those who uh, don't know what happened. Uh, so I would encourage you to be in the group that makes things happen. Uh, here we have a picture of someone, um, you know, working out. You know, let's say that you wanted to get in shape. Uh, you cannot expect to get in shape by just uh, living your regular life, you know, and just watching TV, sitting on, on a couch. Um, you know, that's not going to come to you. The, the, the physical fitness, there has to be a process, right? You have to take some action. You have to go to the gym. You have to work out. You have to run um, and all of those things, right? So you have to take some action in order to get to achieve that goal that you want to do. So so if you if you just live a normal life, you're not going to get that, right? So that that's where the giving more than is expected comes in, right? you cannot expect to get a promotion or a, um, a higher salary if you're just doing the least that is expected of you. An employer is gonna ask you, okay, what, why do you deserve this promotion? Why should I give you a raise? What have you doing uh, outside of your, your, your um, you know, what is required of you to deserve this raise? You know? So this is thing, questions that, that may, come, may be asked to you or even not asked to you, but they're, they're thinking about these things. You know? who, who should get this raise? You know? Who should get this promotion? I worked in places where they only give promotions to certain people or, or give races uh, to certain people who have been outstanding throughout the year. You know, so at the end of the year, the company may be in a tight budget and they may, may only have limited um, bonuses, for example, and um, they may only give it to those employees who have been outstanding throughout the year. And this is where you're going to benefit, you know, because you have, you have always gone above and beyond and there's going to be no question as to who should be the beneficiary of, you know, these promotions or these bonuses, right? And um, I, know, I know of people who think that, you know, I, I will do more when, when the employer pays me more, you know, uh, that's when I will do more. Right now, you know, if they don't pay me more, then I will, won't do more. And I would uh, highly discourage you from taking that, um, that approach because that's not going to benefit you in the long run. You're, you're, you're expecting to receive before you give. You have to give more and then you're going to receive, you know, that's, that's the fundamental law. Um, and, and some may, uh, may argue that, well, my company is going to take advantage of me if I'm always giving more. Um, but you have to evaluate, you know, the company that you're working for. If you see that they're taking advantage of you, perhaps it's time for you to look for another employer who's going to value, you know, who you are, you know, your worth. It's going to, it's going to value for, for what you're worth, you know. So employers who are always giving more, they're always going to be, uh, ha have a higher value and you're going to be more mar marketable, you know, everywhere that you go you're going to be able to showcase, you know, just how good of an employee you are and how valuable you are. And, um, you know, that takes me to the takeaways from, from this presentation. So here you have the five points um, of, you know, five things that you can take, the actions that you can take in order to take your career to the next level. And, and my challenge to you is, you know, try to put this stuff into action and, and, and see for yourself, you know, the, the, um, the impact that it's going to have in your life, in your career overall, you know, and I hope that someday you will come back to me and say, Marco, um, you know, thank you. You know, you helped me with this. And, you know, it has helped me tremendously. And that's what I wanted to share with you guys, because I know that this, this, this works, you know, this, these things work. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you for uh, being a part of this uh, community. And um, just, um, you know, thank you so much. And I'll conclude my presentation with that. Oh, thank you, Marco, for the wonderful session. And we are uh, really learned a lot from the top five tribes, which every engineer should possess. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here and, uh, you know, wish everyone the best luck. Yes. Hope everyone enjoyed the session. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.